preload refers to the ability of the heart to change its force of contraction, and therefore stroke volume, in response to changes in the volume of blood entering the heart, when all other factors remain constant. Preload is determined by venous return, and therefore the circulating volume and the venous capacitance, and ventricular compliance. Adequate intravascular volume is needed to generate sufficient preload to the heart. Volume expansion is often used as first-line therapy for hemodynamic compromise in neonates. In the case of true hypervolemia, fluid resuscitation is important. However, excessive fluid administration is associated with an increase in morbidity and mortality. Potential mechanisms for these adverse effects are that volume overload will result in tissue edema. We must also consider the impact of ventilation on cardiac function, and the differences between spontaneous breath and a positive pressure breath. During spontaneous breathing, the pleural and right atrial pressure falls because the intrathoracic pressure is becoming negative, and therefore there's less pressure in the right atrium, and it's easier for blood to return. Additionally, the intra-abdominal pressure and pressure in the extrathoracic great veins is going to rise. So. The combined benefit of decreasing the right atrial pressure with negative intrathoracic pressure, and the increased abdominal pressure facilitate the venous return to the heart during spontaneous breathing. Systemic venous return can be therefore defined as the mean systemic venous pressure, minus the right atrial pressure, over the resistance in the systemic veins. This diagram shows aortic flow, pulmonary artery flow, and vena cava flow. As you can see, on initiation of positive pressure ventilation, all of these go down because all of what's said before is now the opposite relationship. Therefore, when a positive pressure is introduced into the thorax, the right atrial pressure is increased, and it's going to be harder for that venous return to come in. In conclusion, when you move from spontaneous breathing to mechanical ventilation, you are going to create increased right atrial pressure, which is going to be an impediment to getting venous return. Therefore, we must ensure that the newborn is uvolemic, adequately sedated and avoid venodilatation. As preload, also right ventricular afterload can be adversely affected by positive pressure ventilation. Looking at this figure, what this essentially shows is that, overall, in the lung, if you are too atelectatic or you're too over-distended, you're likely to have elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. So essentially if you look at right ventricular afterload and mechanical ventilation, the goal of mechanical ventilation is to restore functional residual capacity. Both the right ventricular preload and afterload may be adversely affected by mechanical ventilation. But if you titrate ventilation correctly, the right ventricular afterload may be mitigated to increase pulmonary blood flow and therefore, left ventricular preload and as a consequence, the cardiac output. Another important thing to be considered during mechanical ventilation of the newborn infant, is the existing interdependence between the right and left ventricle. This may result in a further decrease of the left ventricular preload and, as a consequence, of the cardiac output, when the newborn has excessive spontaneous breath efforts, because of the right ventricular bulging into the left one. In these cases, it is important to obtain a greater patient sedation and the respiratory muscle paralysis. Volume responsiveness is defined as an increase in stroke volume of 5 to 10 percent secondary to a fluid bolus. Clinical parameters are unreliable in predicting fluid responsiveness and, to date, no studies have assessed the predictive value of dynamic variables for fluid responsiveness in term and preterm infants. In the absence of validated, objective predictive hemodynamic parameters of volume responsiveness in newborn infants, Echocardiographic markers of hypervolemia may be helpful, although we must be aware of the several limitations of this method. Preloading assessment can be reliably made on eyeballing the inferior vena cava and intracardiac filling in expert hands, mainly in the emergency setting and in the not ventilated newborn. To assess inferior vena cava filling place the ultrasound transducer in the midline, just below the xiphistonym, and in the sagittal plane.
the probe marker should be pointing towards the head, so that the heart appears just visible on the right of the screen. The inferior vena cava can be seen coursing through the liver. A normally filled inferior vena cava will have some pulsation with the cardiac cycle and respiratory motion. An underfilled inferior vena cava will be barely visible or collapse entirely on inspiration. An overfilled inferior vena cava will appear large and minimally pulsatile. But beware of the ventilated infant, especially those on high frequency oscillatory ventilation. High interthoracic pressure can effectively tamponade venous return at the level of the inferior vena cava, making it appearing well filled when the cardiac chambers themselves are underfilled. Therefore, when assessing preload status always also examine the intracardiac filling, from the subcostal view, this is convenient as it can follow directly on from the sagittal subcostal view used for inferior vena cava assessment. Visual assessment of the size of cardiac chambers may be also useful for qualitatively estimating the adequacy of ventricular preload. The chambers must be balanced in size, with a possible slight increase of the right cardiac chambers due to the physiological prevalence of the right heart in the newborn. Another useful sign demonstrating the adequacy of left ventricular preload at the visual evaluation is represented by the maintenance of the left ventricular outflow tract patency during the cardiac cycle. Here. We can see partial obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract not due to cardiac hypertrophy, which may suggest the need for IV fluid bolus. In emergency situations, the triad of a kissing small left ventricle cavity, right ventricular size, and a normal or small right atrium is strongly suggestive of hypervolemia. However, this is relevant only in spontaneously breathing patients and not applicable to newborn needing mechanical ventilation, cardiac hypertrophy or abdominal distension. Apart from eyeballing, quantitative methods have been described to assess the fluid responsiveness in children. Various studies have examined the relationship between changes in inferior vena cava diameter during respiration and fluid responsiveness. However, one should be mindful that these methods are validated in self-breathing adults. They are difficult to assess in neonates on mechanical ventilation, and their role in assessing fluid responsiveness in children needing mechanical ventilation remain uncertain. The inferior vena cava collapsibility index is calculated by measuring the maximum and minimum diameter of the inferior vena cava from the subcostal view on echocardiography and a collapsibility of greater than 55% is reported to be predictive of fluid responsiveness. Also, a cutoff value exceeding 18% of change in inferior vena cava diameter between inspiration and expiration in mechanically ventilated patients has been reported to be predictive of fluid responsiveness in adults, and it is often extrapolated in children as well. However, several limitations of this method should be noted. Among these, the standardization and measurement technique, specifically the distance distal to hepatic veins, 1 to 2 cm, and the movement of point of measurement during lung inflation, can be overlooked when using end mode. Using sign loop and manually measuring a fixed anatomical point may overcome this common mistake. The inferior vena cava and abdominal aorta diameters in neonates correlate with gestational age and, and body surface area, as observed for children and adults. This allows us to use calculations from the inferior vena cava to aorta ratio despite gestational age and the neonate's body size. It is known that the abdominal anteroposterior diameter of the aorta remains constant, independent of intravascular volume. In contrast to the anteroposterior width of the vena cava, which is associated with intravascular volume status. Although conclusive studies are still lacking, it is also known that the inferior vena cava to aorta ratio remains constant over the first 48 hours of life in neonates with physiological weight loss up to 8% of birth weight. The variation in left ventricular outflow tract velocity time integral, 
and left ventricular outflow tract peak velocity, at the pulsed wave Doppler, measured at left ventricular outflow tract level or just proximal to aortic valve level during inspiration and expiration, has been reported to predict volume responsiveness. A variation of greater than 15% has been reported to have a high predictive value with a sensitivity and specificity exceeding 90%. To obtain reliable measurements, the newborn must be normorhythmic, without respiratory effort or increased abdominal pressure, and must be ventilated at tidal volume of about 8 ml pro kilograms. Moreover, thorax must be intact. This index has been validated in several studies, including many studies involving children needing mechanical ventilation, and it seems a promising echocardiographic parameter to assess fluid responsiveness in children and neonates.